Hello, in this relatively brief video in this series on the physical exam, I'll be discussing the assessment of a patient's general appearance. This is typically a separate heading within the exam, both during an oral presentation as well as within written documentation. There are many findings that could potentially be included here, which I actually think makes more sense to mention elsewhere. A few examples might be the use of accessory muscles at respiration, which belongs in the pulmonary exam, tremors, which belong within the neuro exam, and pressured speech, or apparent response to internal stimuli, which belong in the psychiatric exam. So what does belong within general appearance? First is whether or not the patient appears acutely ill, and if they do, what appears to be driving it in the most general sense possible. So for example, you might state or write, the patient appears acutely ill, secondary to respiratory distress, or secondary to extreme anxiety, or secondary to abdominal pain. This specific assessment within the exam is not based on their reported symptoms, but rather based on your completely subjective sense from visually observing them. In the past, and you may still see this from time to time, it was common to also describe whether or not someone appeared chronically ill. I previously did this myself, but I now think there are better ways to label what is meant to be conveyed by this. For example, if a patient appears to be of an age that's substantially different than their actual age, you can say, Mr. or Ms. so-and-so appears older, or in some cases younger, than their stated age. I think this is helpful because anecdotally, how patients respond to acute illness, that is, how severe the illness will be at its worst, and how long it takes the patient to recover, seems to be more predictable based on how old or young they look, rather than on how old or young they actually are. Another way to convey chronic illness is by commenting if the patient appears malnourished. Now, how do you tell if someone is malnourished? Well, it's partly based on the BMI or body mass index, but it's also a lot more than just the BMI. It's also whether a patient has a loss of subcutaneous tissue in several typical locations, such as the temples, in which case it's referred to as temporal wasting. Patients can also have loss of muscle mass in the hands, uh, the back of the hands specifically, um, or in the deltoids or sort of in the hip areas. Clinicians will sometimes use the adjective cachectic to describe the appearance of someone who seems particularly malnourished. In my opinion, that word can be a little misleading because cachexia, as a medical term, means something a little more specific than just malnourished. It's the combination of weight loss, fatigue, generalized muscle weakness, and abnormal labs consistent with chronic illness, such as anemia, low albumin, and increased inflammatory markers, which is part of a systemic metabolic derangement that usually coexists with poor nutrition, but which is not synonymous with it. What's another characteristic that can be included here under general appearance? This is not common, but if someone has an abnormality of their stature, uh, I would include it here, for example, if they have dwarfism. Likewise, if you are interviewing or examining them in a mobility device, such as a wheelchair, I would mention that here too, using direct but objective language, such as patient seated in an electric wheelchair. If there are abnormalities of the patient's clothing, that would be included here too. The most common example of this would be a patient in unusually disheveled or dirty clothing. Uh, this might suggest or be the consequence of things like poverty, homelessness, uh, mental illness, and or substance abuse. I mean, maybe even dementia. But there are other examples of abnormal clothing that require next level observation. If a patient is wearing clothes that are either far too warm or not warm enough for the weather, you know, that might suggest an abnormality of temperature regulation, as you might see in thyroid disease. You could notice that a patient is wearing clothes that are unusually big for them, which might suggest recent weight loss. You might see a patient deliberately wearing untied shoes or wearing sandals when their shoes no longer fit properly due to lower extremity edema. Another physical characteristic that would fall under general appearance is an unusual odor. So now that doesn't refer to plain old routine body odor. Particularly in the era of open notes, when a, a patient can access 
uh, their medical record directly from home, I would not include that in any formal documentation. However, there are far less common but more specific odors that you definitely should. The three classic ones, the fruity breath of patients experiencing ketoacidosis, in which the smell is caused by the body's production of acetone, an ammonia or urine-like odor on the breath of people with uremia from advanced kidney failure called uremic feeder, which is caused by urea, and a distinctive smell called feeder hepaticus observed in the breath of a minority of patients with advanced liver failure. This odor is described as being sweet, but musty and feculent at the same time. Yes, it is an unusual smell. It's believed to be primarily caused by the compound dimethyl sulfide. In addition to these classically described odors, there's also an autosomal recessive genetic condition called trimethylaminuria or fish odor syndrome in which patients emit a smell that resembles rotting fish. It's caused by a deficiency in an enzyme that metabolizes the compound trimethylamine, which is directly responsible for the smell. This problem is thought to be underrecognized with most affected individuals and those around them as just assuming that they have bad BO due to, due to poor hygiene, which can lead to significant psychosocial distress. The final physical characteristic is an unusual skin tone, aside from rashes or focal depigmentation, which should be described within the dermatologic exam. What are some examples that belong here? Well, for example, cyanosis, which is a bluish tinge to the skin. If present only in the fingers and the toes, it's known as peripheral cyanosis, and has a number of causes, for example, just being really cold. However, if also present in the lips and perioral region, it's known as central cyanosis and is specific for hypoxemia. Interestingly, the presence of central cyanosis corresponds to the concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood rather than the oxygen saturation itself. Therefore, in a patient with severe anemia, it can take a profoundly low oxygen saturation to cause central cyanosis whereas for a patient with an unusually high hemoglobin concentration, known as polycythemia, it can take a surprisingly modest degree of hypoxemia to cause cyanosis. Other abnormalities of general skin tone include jaundice, which is a yellowish discoloration due to high levels of bilirubin in the blood, itself due to either obstruction in the biliary system, liver dysfunction, or hemolysis of red blood cells. Patients with anemia can be unusually pale, which might be most evident in their mucous membranes, including the conjunctiva of the eyes. An abnormal bronze discoloration of the skin can be seen in hemochromatosis and primary adrenal insufficiency due to excessive melanin production and deposition. On the other hand, a complete absence of melanin leads to an absence of skin and hair pigmentation called albinism. Argyria is the name to a bluish-gray skin discoloration caused by the ingestion of silver, which is sometimes used as an alternative health remedy that is neither safe nor effective. And some critically ill patients may develop a difficult-to-describe ashen gray color, which may not be caused by any one compound or pathologic mechanism, but is anecdotally a poor prognostic sign. An important note on all of these abnormalities of skin tone. The ability to detect them is dependent on the individual's natural skin tone. It's just harder to see most of these in dark-skinned individuals. Sometimes there will be other ways to tell. For example, people with jaundice will also develop yellow eyes known as icterus. That's present regardless of their natural skin tone. And pale conjunctiva are as easy to see in the eyes of all people, if you remember to look. Cyanosis in dark-skinned people may also be easier to note in the conjunctiva, as well as on the tongue, palms, and the nail beds. But once again, you need to remember to look if you are suspicious of that possibility. Finally, when it comes to documenting the general appearance in a written medical note for a healthy individual, it might be very brief. Something like, appear state of age, well-nourished, in no apparent distress, you may see that last phrase abbreviated in charts as NAD.